Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you role models sharing their leadership knowledge and experience and wisdom. E2 Adventures in 2016, and your mission is to help the next generation understand how the world is changing from the front lines. And I understand E2 is an ed tech company. Is that right? Ed, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, you're based out of Montreal. Okay, a cyclist is crossing the street. Should you keep going and, and your car can't stop? Should you keep going into the cyclist? Should you turn left into an elderly gentleman sitting sipping his coffee? Or should you turn right? And you don't know what's on the right side. There's a little overhang, but there's a 50% chance you'll severely hurt yourself. There's a 50% chance that you might uh, uh, not hurt yourself. And, wow. and, and this, is, this is a real world issue that's being programmed into vehicles that we're going to put to the audience live. And they're going to see that, wow, these ethical questions are being grappled today by the engineers who we're in the car with. And I need to vote. Stopping isn't an option. So what are people, children learning when they see this? What are you hoping for? There are so many layers of what I hope the audience learns. My hope, my grand, so for everyone, I, I, I'm, we're looking for an expansion of consciousness mm -hmm. at, at a basic level that there's a world beyond your school or your home or your day-to-day -day life. So that for us is a success. The next layer is to show that what you're learning in school is actually applicable in the real world. But the real reason why we're running this program is that we really want people to see that there are problems that still need to be solved mm -hmm. and that we don't have enough people working on them and that there's opportunity in participating in the development of the world today. Not all, The adults of today have not solved every problem. And by showing these problems to the next generation, they can see that they can have a hand in making a difference. Okay. Uh, so does that mean you put people, uh, do you give them societal issues to, to consider and to think about? Or is it just a normal day-to-day -day management job they can have an insight in? How, so well, how do you think you're talking? Maybe I should... Yeah, so, so let me give you a few more examples because th this is, uh, you know... I need, I need. I just need a quick moment to reflect. It's hard when you're when you're when I'm juggling so many, so many ideas and industries. We work in fifty industries, and within each industry, there's multiple companies and different ways of expressing that place. Um, I'm going to ask you to repeat the question in just a moment, but I just need to explain the breadth of what it is that we do before jumping back in. I just wanted to share, for example, um, we we have different programs, for example, going into the hearts of data centers, of factories, of ports, of landfills, of um, trucking depots, of um, electrical grids, financial systems. Our goal isn't, isn't only to pose ethical questions to students, but, sim but, but to help them see how we're all connected in these ways through these various systems so that they can identify problems of any caliber. It can be a social problem, like what we mentioned before. It can be an environmental problem, an economic problem. And through that, that they find their own way. And so, yes, a lot of people may find that they want to work at a certain in a certain company or industry in a role that is predefined. But in a world that's changing, where you don't know what the jobs are going to be in the future, the next best thing you can do is understand what are the underlying systems and technologies that are changing the world so that by the time I'm ready to make a difference, I'm ready to make a difference. So, and that could be innovation capacity, entrepreneurship capacity, design, it could be in politics. There's so many ways to do it. And with you know all these industries clashing, um, it's, it's difficult to predict even for the experts on the front lines. I got that. So you're describing what people would call 21st century skills, helping to develop that? Yeah, exactly. Or what, how we see ourselves is as uh, deliverers of context. So, you know, we're not, we're not teaching people how to code. We're not running boot camps for entrepreneurship. We're rather 
context providing or dem democratizing access to the real world so that they understand the value of 21st century skills. Yeah. Uh, and it also rings, uh, resonates with me that uh, you're actually explaining why do I have to learn math? Why do I have to learn physics? Well, because you're going to apply it in that particular scenario. That's exactly it. And and um, what's what's interesting is that when, when you, for, for many people, their experience in school is that uh, their educators will bring up specific examples to help bring that particular theory point to life. For many students, that theory point is tied to that specific example that the teacher gave. When what we're finding is that there are there's a myriad of examples existing and not yet existing that can be inspirational for for people that and worth and by helping people think in systems and giving them the confidence that they can find these connections for themselves in the world that they can they can find greater use for their education out there once they graduate. Hey, got that. Uh, Gregory, question. Uh, your own background. Um, I was wondering if that's because you're dealing doing ed tech. Uh, is it your background education? Is it a technical background or is it entrepreneurship? So where did you come from, which brought you the skills where, uh, to allow you to do what you're doing right now? That's a great question. Thank you. And I'll do my best to answer it. I'm not an educator. However, I, I am a guest lecturer at the Faculty of Education at McGill University in Montreal. I, 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 I forget if I said guest lecturer. Um, I, my parents are entrepreneurs. Yeah. Our backgrounds are in the textiles and yarn industries. I had this belief growing up that I would one day work for my parents. And so I was very liberal in what I decided to study. I followed my heart. I studied science in high school. I did liberal arts in pre-college. I eventually studied business in university, but it wasn't, it wasn't until after I graduated that I realized I wanted to make a difference in the world, a, a, an impact in sustainability. And that could touch on society or the environment or um, innovation wise. The issue is that I didn't really know much about the world aside from my parents' companies. Okay. And so my personal journey to creating E2 Adventures was really based in knocking on every single company's door that was possible to reach on every highway and every high rise, inviting myself into the operation simply to understand how does your company work? And through that, I found so many problems that I could work on. And I think at some point it just switched for me. I said, I can either work on, I can either work on solving these problems or I can create a platform that can open the door for millions of people to solve these problems. And so I chose the second route. Great. Hey, by the way, did you disappoint your parents not uh, following their footsteps or their way or were they okay? Uh, this is, you know, our, at family dinners, it goes between utter support and inviting me back into the family business yeah. um you know it's it's a mixed bag when it comes to to yeah. um, well, um my always, uh, my parents but um yeah. I, I i do have their support so that is yeah. I'm, I'm very fortunate for that yeah but get your parents on record i say i, I would say just get them uh, to join your program turn it around i'd say i i, I think so i think yeah. so and um and uh well and that's really where we're where we're trying to grow things. So you know, our family businesses are are okay. are small. The companies we work with are typically very large industries. We're thinking, you know, private jet manufacturers. You know, yeah. our goal is to show people the big picture. But yeah. ultimately, when it comes um, down the road, when we create our uh, when we roll out our our in person visit program, we want to incentivize people to visit small businesses like those of my parents. You know, in your own community, um, visit going behind the scenes of the restaurants, the uh, car dealerships, the the, uh, the places you never even thought of, like the warehouses and data centers, so that or a telecommunications towers, because these are all somehow connected. And yet, and you know, it doesn't have to be a massive industry for you to get or take inspiration from this as your starting point in your journey of expanding your consciousness. Okay, now. Uh, thank you for that, by the way. Now, Greg, you, you're probably familiar with the story about if you take a doctor 
from 100 years ago, around 1900, put him in an operating room today, he would be clueless. Same with the pilot. He would be completely, utterly clueless and useless in a modern day plane 100 years later. If you pick up a teacher and put him in the classroom, he'd recognize, hey, I see that same class of kids. Uh, it hasn't changed that much. Uh, I've also seen people who are not who don't have that educational background when they try to innovate education, they get a pushback. Well, you don't understand education because you're not from our industry. So it hasn't changed that much over the years. What's your experience with schools, with teachers when you uh, talk about what you're trying to do here? And I love I think this is a great question. I'd love to say two things. Firstly, you're right. As a non-educator, we rely on, we, we we work with educational consultants to really help us understand what are the connections to the curriculum. But I would actually disagree with your point that that um, that there, the capacity for, oh, I mean, the way I interpreted your point was that the capacity for change among teachers hasn't really been prevalent over the past hundred years. I would say that, I would say that the, the main thing that has existed a hundred years ago is still there today. And it's actually quite a positive thing. And okay. that positive thing is the potential of every teacher to take this theory, their theory that they're masters of and apply it in a totally new context. So if you take a, a, a teacher from a hundred years ago and, you know, and you go to a, a, a carriage factory where they're making car carriages for horses, they would apply the same logic for this new context they never thought of or seen as a teacher today visiting a, a uh, I would say, you know, a quantum computer or maybe some, let's think of an equivalent, uh, a, a car manufacturer, right? S um, same teacher has never been to this industrial context. For both teachers, it's a new environment. And we see our role as the bridge between the education system and, and the economy as really providing the frameworks for teachers to see that they have this all under control and to help them activate their, their inner Miss Frizzle, who, who, who is a, a character in a 90s TV show called The Magic School Bus, to activate, to activate this risk taker within them to and, and provide them the support to say, you know what, I can visit this new place I don't know anything about. And I know that, let's say you're an English teacher, I know we will find an issue that we that we can debate, that we can talk about, that we can write about. Let's say you are a math teacher. We're gonna find we're gonna find a shape in this factory, and we're gonna talk about the importance of that shape in the big picture. Or we're gonna find trigonometry in this place. Let's say you're a science teacher. We're gonna find our theory in 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 life sciences or planetary sciences. There is always a connection for every core discipline and. And so when we look ahead at the 21st century, I don't think the education system really needs to change. The theory is there and it applies to the world. So it's not the content of what we teach and discuss in school, it's the format, it's the mechanism by which it's communicated. And we firmly believe that the future of education is in experiential learning. That's a very good insight, uh, Greg. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Now. Uh, two more topics uh, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss with you. First of all, you mentioned uh, uh, 50 different industries you have already brought into the classroom. Uh, first of all, how many classrooms? Uh, how many people, how many children uh, ha do you think you've been able to reach and educate in this manner? Yeah, so thank you. That's a great question. Uh, since so since the beginning of this school year, we have run October, November, December, January, February. Uh, we run five events so far, and uh, um, we always do it in different languages. So this year, we've been doing them in English and French. Um, and we've had 25,000 registrations, and, and uh, with the average class size of 25 students, I'll let the audience do the math of how many yes. of how many Good. teachers and classrooms we've reached, and and this is this is across every grade level. So for the same event, we'll have students who are ten years old as seventeen years old, and we'll have also 
every single class, uh, every single discipline represented from different schools. So we'll have language, social studies, math, and so on, because everyone's pulling from the real world, whatever, whatever it is that they need for their class. Nice. Now, you do this out of Canada. Uh, I understand you've recent, you're also expanding to the United States. Uh, any other plans to turn this uh, global or, or even more international? Absolutely. So as, as a live streaming organization, as a nonprofit, our goal is to uh, secure, secure funding to maintain our program as free and which allows us the resources to simply get the word out there that that schools around the world can participate in these exclusive behind the scenes experiences uh, to places that you could never really visit in person. And, and so I understand the audience is, is international. And so if, if there are classrooms in your communities that you think would appreciate benefiting from this free program, by all means, we invite everyone to register and participate. So they can reach out to you to uh, uh, E2. By the way, the, the, the name E2, where does the name uh, come from? E2 Adventures. What's the E2 stand for? So when we started, it was really, uh, E2 was education. It was bridging education. That's the first E and economy, the second E. From a sustainability perspective, it wasn't really a sexy name at the time. And so we uh, quickly rebranded to experiential education. Those being our two E's. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh that's a good serendipitous that you still are able to use the two E's there. So uh, planning to grow, grow international, get more students, more topics, more countries involved in this exploration, uh, experience, uh, experience, experiential that, education. Experiment, that is, a, it's a difficult world to, I'll stick with E2 to be honest, uh, easier to pronounce. Um, e now, two. In this whole endeavor, uh, do you have mentors, role models? Uh, where do you draw your inspiration from uh, so you know you're on the right track? That's a, another great question. I, I feel crazy a lot of the time because what we're doing has never been done before. So it just takes a ton of sanity checks um, for every discipline in school, we're like, we return to teachers and say, are we still on the mark? Are we still on track? Uh, and so we have, we have contacts throughout different school boards, school districts around the world who we, we touch base on, especially the IB program. Um, and within industry, just to make sure that we're, that we're aligned with, um, with, um, organizations <laughs> policies as, as live streamers, for example, um, we can't show certain things that are protected by intellectual property. And so we have, we have, I, I have a lot of mentors to figure out ways around that to yeah. communicate the world to students who wouldn't otherwise be able to see it by through, um, through this means. But, you know, um, as an adventurer, I consider myself an adventurer and I've picked up a lot of mentors along the way who, uh, who align with this, with this vision of interconnection and education. Yeah. And what's your, what's your inspiration source? I have three inspiration sources, let's say. Um, Willy Wonka from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Um, if you think about it, um, that factory was closed to the community and then they opened the doors and only five kids were allowed in, but you know, we're inviting the world. The second inspiration source is someone named Miss Frizzle from the Magic School Bus, who I mentioned earlier. And the third source is a, a television series called How It's Made by Discovery Channel. They were very popular in the 20, in the 90s and 2000s. And, and they're all based in my city. So I, I benefit from meeting with their team and getting inspired by, by how they changed the world of industry education. Great. Now, uh, last couple of questions, uh, Greg. I, I loved talking to you about what you're doing, uh, helping to, uh, you could say, provide those 20 percent your skills um has it been a bumpy road so far what were the big mistakes you've made along the way and how did you recover yeah so so growing this initiative i mean i must have quit 20 times um, and then i would speak to one of my mentors who's my mother and she'd sit me down and talk me back up and remind me of what my vision is and what what I want to accomplish. And then I would get right back in there. 
And before the pandemic, we weren't actually an education technology company. We were running in-person field trips. There was a vision for creating a platform for that. But when the pandemic hit and all my schools and all my industries closed, I, I threw the towel in until one of our contacts at Google called us and said, Greg, are you still running data center visit programs? We have funding if you want to continue doing stuff as a pandemic response measure where we're, we're contributing to nonprofits on the front lines. And I realized we can give the people who are making masks and vaccines and medication cameras, and we can stream that to kids in schools. And so we took, we went from totally shutting down to getting back on our feet and becoming a, a broadcast platform organization or what you can, or what we call ourselves an ed tech charity. An ed tech charity. Hey, so you've already shared a lot of very useful lessons and insights uh, for people who want to start their own career. Uh, what would you like to add to what we've already discussed? What would your advice be? What I've found over the years for people who see the big picture, I've only found two sets of questions that were asked. The first set of, set of question is, where does it come from? Where does it go and why? And so I encourage everybody to, for example, look at the world, look, look at the room you're in right now and ask yourself, do I actually know where that comes from? And do I know where it's going? Have I truly, do I understand how it got to me? And by asking this question and getting up and calling the company and visiting them, the companies you pass every day, you will find not only opportunities for yourself, not necessarily at that company, but in the systems you're exploring, but a, a deeper understanding of how the world is changing so you can see how you will fit in when you're, when you're ready. The second set of questions I found is who owns that? So similar questioning, not where does it come from, where does it go, but, but following the chain of, of ownership and seeing, and then being able to see the interconnected nature of things and then understanding through that lens what part of the world you want to be a part of. Great. Hey, Greg, I want to thank you so much for doing your part, helping this very complex and changing world uh, come alive and helping people to understand how to navigate that, I guess. So I really want to thank you for your time and uh, sharing what you're doing with me too. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.